My name is Nancy Hernandez, and joining me today is Pat Norwood. Thank you, Pat, for being with us today You're and welcome. sharing your memories. <laughs> Why don't you tell us a little bit about where you grew up in Mount Airy? Okay, well, not too far from here, down at the bottom of the street, across from the old firehouse, it's Hood Street. And I lived in the first house right behind what was in Butler's Garage. And um, the area has not changed. It looks exactly the same as what it did when I grew up. Nothing has changed in that area at all. Uh, uh, everything's the same. It was Hood, and then off of that was Hotel Street, which ran behind the downtown, and then Baker Avenue. And those were the streets that um, I, I was most familiar with and knew the people and played with the kids and things like that when I was growing up. And I think that one house on Hotel Street is the first house in town, right? One of the oldest houses in town. I am not sure about that. I, I don't know. It was there when, you know, when I can first remember things. But uh, since I came here when I was supposedly three months old, I don't remember a whole lot <laughs> back that far. <laughs> so you've lived your entire life here in Mount Airy? Yes. Oh, well, that's exciting. Right. Yes. So you'll be the perfect person to ask some of these questions too. You were mentioning before that you had seen multiple fires here in, right. in the downtown area. Can you tell us a little bit about your experience with that? Well, yeah. Um, I can remember uh, back in, I think it was 1955, um, the house, two houses up from us burned that night. In the, it, all these things happened at night, it seemed. and. Um, there was an older couple lived there with their son, um, and uh, all of a sudden you hear, of course the firehouse was just right down the street, so I was lucky, but uh, um, the front of the house, because it started under the front porch, under circumstances that I am not sure, I've heard tales, but I'm not sure, um, and um, the gentleman that lived there, Ori Runkles, that was the father and the mother, and then uh, then the son was Elwood. Um, he ran down to get the fire department, and he thought his wife, he, he came back to get his wife out. Well, eventually they did, but the unfortunate part was she was never, she did not pet die in the fire, but she uh, was never re fully recovered from it and eventually did several years later, a few years later. Oh. And it started under the front porch in some leaves and um, their son Elwood, or Citation as he was known to everybody in town, um, was a deaf mute and um, he loved to play with matches. And it was fall and there were a lot of leaves around and um, kind of maybe think that something started from something he did, but nobody ever knew for sure. And it didn't spread to the other houses though? No, the fire no, they were separate, right. It did not spread, that one did not, no. And that's when the fire department was where the um, Down there Crying own. Johnny's is mm -hmm. now, right? Right, that's okay. right. They were close, they were close. Thank goodness. Right. Yeah, right, right. And what about the fires that were right on Main Street? Were you here for any of those? Oh yeah. Yeah. Tell, tell how that went. Well, uh, the um, the next one, this was all, as I said, at that point I was like 14 years old, so okay. Um, the next one um, went to um, uh, 1961, and that was when the um, uh, warehouse for Mount Airy Furniture and Appliance burned down, here again in the middle of the night. Uh, and that was located up above where the Flatiron Building is now, going up Park Avenue. And I can still remember going down and um, sitting on the front porch of a lady that I knew, and she had a daughter that was about my age, uh, watching it burn from the top of the apartment over Butler's Garage. Out here again was the middle of the night, and the thing was burnt to the ground then. <laughs> so. Uh, that's been a big memory too. Um, and then in 1963, the old B.S. Dorsey building, which was also owned by Mount Airy Furniture and Appliance, burnt. And um, the thing I remember about that night was I had was a little older now and I was married. I had been to the bowling alley, which was down the street, and I walked home down to Hood Street 
still, because at that point, after I got married, I moved from one side of the double house to the other side of the double house. I didn't go far with my husband. And as I went by, I can remember, it's about 10 o'clock, I can remember smelling smoke, but I didn't look around, didn't see anything, didn't see anything. So went on home. A couple hours later, here again in the middle of the night, here comes the fire. The building was engulfed. My father's grocery store was right next, across the alley from it, right next to it, and uh, there was a store of Happy uh, and Albright and uh, Horace Hipsley, a furniture and appliance store, and if it wouldn't have been that my father and Happy were up on the roof with hoses, theirs would have been goners because the wind was coming in <laughs> their direction, and they spent the night up there with hoses while the building burned down. Oh gosh! Uh, yeah, tell me about it. It's pretty, it, you know, it's pretty dramatic when you're that young to, um, for all that stuff to happen. Yeah. And then in 1969, I was working down at the old First National Bank. Uh, it was a Friday night. It was just 50 years ago recently, um, and um, I had to go in early because the bank opened up at. Oh, about six o'clock, I think, and I had to go in and do posting before they opened up. So I was the only one in the lower level of the bank, and I'm in there on the posting machine, and all of a sudden the current went off, and I looked out the back window, and all I could see was black smoke and flames. And I'm no no one else was due to arrive yet, so I thought, oh my gosh, I got to get out of here. I can't post, and you know I don't know what's going to happen, but let me out. So I ran up the front the back the steps up to the top and out the front door and um, my car was on the upper lot thank goodness not uh, but I even had to move it because the heat got so intense uh, tense during this conflict because it just went it started in the back and it worked its way up through the uh, the office and what have you the back of, of the, which building uh, the old the old mill Mount Airy Milling Company oh, okay. which is where the railroad tracks are now uh, it started back there on that bank and went forward, and um, as I said, it even took out the, the side. There was two silos, big si grain silos between it and the bank building, um, which they got all, they didn't fall, but they, the tops burn out of them and what have you. Several years later, they dismantled them. Um, it did not actually, other than it did bust a bunch of the glass out of the windows of the bank on the south side. Uh, it did not harm the bank, but um, that was on, as I say, it was on a Friday night. It started about 5 or 5.30 before I, because I could not get home because Pro Prospect Road was blocked, South Main Street was blocked, you know, the whole thing. So it was about 10, 11 o'clock that night before I could get off the parking lot and go around Robin Hood's barn to get my car back to the house. Oh, wow. And no cell phones, so you had no way to contact anybody. I just sit, stood and sat there and watched the whole thing go down. Your family must have been frantic. Well, I don't know what they were doing, to be honest with you. I, I, you know, my husband was probably coming home from work in Frederick because that's where he worked, you know. And I'm sure he had to know something was going on because there was smoke everywhere. Uh, uh, but uh, that's about as close as I want to come to thinking that, you know, if this thing comes the wrong way, I'm going to be stuck in here. <laughs> yeah, well, and they didn't rebuild the mill after that, did they? No, they did not. No, yeah. they did not. And they, as I said, they tore the silos down three or four years later. They remember, they had a crew out of Baltimore that came and did it. With the, and um, they would, we had a, a break room in the bank, in the lower level, and they'd come in there and eat their uh, lunch. And we had a big party for them when they got done. Even though, you know, they weren't doing it for us, they were doing it for the mill. But uh, they were a nice bunch of guys and hard working too. Yeah. That's awesome. Now, yeah. you're one of the few people that actually remembers the bank being a functioning facility. Oh, it was beautiful. At one time, it was beautiful. You don't want to go by, I, I shudder every time I go by there looking at that now because it was all granite in there and had this beautiful farm mural across the top of the cellar line. And it, it, was, it was a lovely place. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about working there. Did everyone from town go to that particular bank? Pretty much or? because at, at the time that I was working there, that was the only bank. So, um, or not when I started working there, it was the only bank. As I wound up, there was some more that added on in town, in, not in the downtown area, but in the outlying areas as Mount Airy expanded. 
so there was more competition. But back when I started, um, everything was done by hand. You wrote out a deposit slip by hand. You posted it by hand. You sent out the statements by hand. Everything, you filed checks by hand. And everything was totally different than what it is now. And it had the big massive safe to put all the money? Yeah, well, there was two, one up and one down. Downstairs housed the checks and the, 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 the bank supplies, okay. The upstairs was the safe deposit boxes and the money. Now, when did you start working there? 1958. And you worked there until when? Uh, 1962. And when? Oh, did not you... 1962, 2002, big deal. Oh, you worked there many, many years. Many years, 44. So you saw a lot of changes within oh, yes. just the banking industry oh, yes. here in Mount Airy. Right. The bank's been sold twice since I retired, and thank goodness I was retired, <laughs> because I don't think I would want to go through that. Uh, but anyway, uh, I used to enjoy it when it was a hands-on experience, and everybody, I have people still tell me they wish I was at the bank <laughs> to help them, because everything now is so, you know, Everything's done by computers and stuff like that. There is no that much per there is not much personal contact where back in that day there was. Everybody knew everybody. And the fact that you worked at the bank, that often led to you meeting numerous people in town and getting involved in many organizations. Oh yes. Right. Tell us a little bit about your experiences doing that. Oh my. Well, let me see. I uh, I guess the first thing I well Mount Airy had uh, a celebration in 1976 for the bicentennial of the t uh, country. And there was a committee formed that met two years before that, and we had a big celebration there for a couple of days over one the weekend in June in 1976. And I was the treasurer of that. And then when we had the 100th anniversary of Mount Airy in 1994, I was the treasurer of that and worked with Travis Norwood, who was a um, third cousin of my husband, uh, along with a, another group of people, you know, to help arrange that, and I was the treasurer of that. Um, I joined the Kiwanis Club. That's been probably the most recent thing that I joined. Um, I joined that back um, probably about 18 years ago. And my daughter, uh, who's a chip off the old block, she, she's the treasurer, I'm the assistant treasurer only. Um, I graduated from Mount Airy High School in 1958 and for many, many years from the 1970, late 70s up until just a couple of years ago, I was the treasurer and practically the only person that we did an annual banquet. I got that together, organized it. We had it every year in September. Um, they've had the first class graduated in, there in 2012. I was a little before my time. But they've always had banquets, and they used to have them out of town. When I was involved with it, they would alternate between the American Legion and the fire company each year. For the graduates? For the, for the graduates of the school. And it, there were many, okay. quite a, I have a whole list of everybody that ever graduated. I gave up the treasurer's job two years ago because it just got to be too much. Um, I was also involved in forming the Historical Society with Travis Norwood. That came from out of the 1994 um, 100-year anniversary. It evolved from that, and I was the treasurer of that up until two years ago. What were some of the activities that you did for the anniversary? Uh, for the anniversary, well, we had a parade and um, uh, programs and different things that went on through town in the course of a couple a weekend uh, there. Because now we're getting ready to celebrate the 125th anniversary. I know anniversary. we are, right. <laughs> Well, back for the 1976 one, I had a friend make me, because they wanted everybody to dress in costume, she made me a, uh, a dress. Took 12 yards of material. Uh, it was in June, so it was the yellow dotted Swiss. And I got, I borrowed a hoop from somebody, I'm not sure who, and I set out Nobody could get within six feet of me because I wore that thing all weekend and I thought, oh my gosh, <laughs> I still have the dress. I don't have the hoop, but the dress is still home. Was it hot? Not really because it was short sleeved and kind of scoop necked and um, it was a, a summery material. Uh, the skirt part might have been, it was a little awkward because yeah. if you sat down, it went up in the air. <laughs> Always wondered so you about had to that. watch what you were doing, but anyway, I made it through that whole weekend with 
and we had there were banquets involved in it both of those we had a banquet and a program and what have you and then as I said the parades and the other organization uh, you know things through town and then I guess finally I guess the last thing I, I mean I have been the treasurer of Pine Grove Cemetery for about the last 25 30 years uh, still am. That I have not given up yet. I wouldn't mind it, but I have not done it yet. I'm still hanging in there on that. So tell us a little bit about how the organizations are different now or the same. Are they pretty much? They're different. Okay, tell us a little bit about how that is. Well, back, my husband, see, I'm, my, I was in the Hall of Fame. My husband was in the Hall of Fame. He was also person of the year back in 2000, I think it was. My daughter's in the Hall of Fame. They're very civic-minded people, and I guess this is why I wore off on me, I, or maybe I should say it wore off on my daughter. Um, but back in the day when my husband first joined, which was probably late 60s, um, they were younger people. Um, maybe the oldest one, there was a few older ones, but uh, in most of them were either in their 30s, 40s, maybe 50s. Nowadays, the club consists of mostly older people. My daughter, who is a, probably does everything that can be, she lives and breathes Kiwanis, um, is the youngest one. And uh, she's going to be uh, uh, 52 next week. So <laughs> that tells you. And you just can't, everybody is so busy. You, you know, you try to get new members, you try to get young blood in there to help because a lot of these people aren't physically able to come, but they do come out and help with the functions. Um, and everybody's the same way. Everybody you talk to with all the clubs say they just can't get any young people interested in it because there's so many other things going on that uh, they just don't want to do this. That is interesting. Whereas when you got started, that was more of the social yeah, it was, fa right. fabric the, of the, the town. The membership is probably twice what it is now. Uh huh. It was all male, though, at that time. It wasn't until the 90s that they let females in, my daughter being one of them, because she used to uh, come, even when she was in high school, and to go to the meetings, even though she wasn't allowed to be a member, and um, play piano, because she was a piano player, and she plays for everything. But anyway, um, she played that, and then when they started allowing ladies in, um, then she joined, and I always remember her saying that, they had always said, why do you want to join and pay dues when you can come for free? <laughs> and she says, because I want to be a Kiwanian. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> he was a character, my husband was. Yeah. Now, where did you meet? Did you meet in town? My husband? Yes. Well, that's another long story because he is three years older than, and a day older than I am, but I never met him. He had... He had health problems all his life, and two bouts of rheumatic fever, polio, he had polio, he had what they call Perthitz disease, and in the process, he was three years ahead of me at one point, but in the process, he missed out on three years of school. And he came back when I was in the 10th grade, I had no idea who he was, never saw him before in my life, and joined our class, and he was the president of our senior class because everybody thought of him as a father figure. And I still didn't pay that much attention to him, although I worked in my father's store after school and on, after school and on weekends, and he worked at Lindsey Browning's across the street. And somehow or the other, with a hookup with a, a, a customer that used to hang out over there, he started sending notes across the street to me, and this was even after we graduated. I mean, I knew he was, but I was not close to it. Um, we started going together, and eventually we married. Oh, that's so nice. <laughs> and he's been on the town council, and he's been on, he's been involved in everything too, right, yeah, through town. But unfortunately, he died in 2002 yeah. uh, from heart trouble, which I'm sure, you know, stemmed from all the things that he, he had a long period there where he was pretty healthy, and then he started going downhill because he had a heart attack and subsequent problems after that. Oh, so, sorry. Right, right. But anyway, yeah, he's, everybody always talks about Wayne because anybody that was around knew him, knew him very well. And here again, he was instrumental in getting Prospect Park. Uh, he was on the board, on the Parks and Rec at that time, the town council, and got that park started, and the Kiwanis, with their help, 
got it built. There was a plaque down there that had his name on it, but they had to take it up last year because, excuse me, because the rains were so bad, it washed the bank down, and they had to get the plaque out to save it. Yeah, so, tell us a little bit about that. I think you attended one of the Parks and Recreation meetings to talk about. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay, maybe that's, yeah, I did, right, yes. right. Tell us a little bit about getting that park started. That's really fascinating. Well, uh, it kind of been in the works off and on or, you know, for quite a while. But when my, my husband got on Parks and Rec, he just got involved in it. And um, I think Larry Hutchauer has it now as a big folder that, you know, what all he went through to get it zoned. And I can still remember kids were younger. It was nothing but a wilderness down there. I mean, you, it was terrible. And we went down there one day and Wayne and I and the two girls and walked back in there and it was awful and when we came home every one of us was covered from head to toe with sticky burrs it took me days to get it off the clothes of everybody so that i could wash them and then they, they went in and they cleaned out the underbrush and did all that and of course eventually put in the pond and things like that and that was the kiwanis right the kiwanis uh, well the club. kiwanis helped clean out the underbrush they didn't put in the pond because that took you know, permits and town work and things like that. But uh, it eventually, and then the pavilion got built down there. Um, of course, they still have fishing tournaments and things there at the pond in the walkway around it. It's evolved some since then, but it may, basically looks like what it did when it first opened up. Well, that's yeah. nice. So something's remained similar. Yeah, right, that's right. Nice. Well, tell us a little bit more about your experiences going to school right here. You attended the high school that was just up the hill on Main Street. Right? Mm -hmm. I did, right. What was that like? Because uh, that's a, a relatively small school. How many people did you have in your class? What kind of um, things did you do for fun? Well, and, and usually my classes, <coughs> I, I'm not sure, but I would say probably about 30. Uh, but there were, like each grade that I went through, there was a couple of different, like first grades, second grades, third grades. They weren't, weren't all in one room. Um, and I had a lot of the homegrown local teachers all through elementary school, which I thought the world of. And of course, they're all gone now, but they were great. And then high school was still in this. I attended high school in that old building until uh, through 11th grade. They were building the what is now gone, but is the middle school um, down over the hill. So my class was the first class to go there for the senior year. It was brand new when we went there. And I graduated. I spent one year down there. The other 11 were at the school at the top of the hill. Yeah. So what kind of things did you do for fun? Did, did you have lunch breaks on the grounds, or did you walk downtown? To, oh, no, we didn't, we didn't walk downtown. Uh, in fact, because I lived... Uh, uh, so far away, they had no bus service in town. My father would eat, take me to school. I always used to kid me because my father would bring me to school and then send one of his, he employed half the young guys in town, send one of them, whoever drew, drew stra short straw, up to pick me up when school was over. <laughs> um, when it was up here at the top of the hill now. Right. By the time I was a senior, I had my driver's license, so that we didn't do go through that. So. So what did you do to celebrate graduation? What kind of things? That, you uh, said there was a banquet for well, all the graduates. Well, the, not so much the graduation, but the, the, the Alumni Association. Used to have it back in the day in June, and then it switched over to uh, September, somewhere along the line. Um, and anybody that graduated from the school that was still alive from 1912 on, um, you know, was invited. And they always used to, they, I, back in the day, they used to have a band come and a dance and things like that, and along with the banquet and uh, people talking about things. They gave up on the, ba on the band and the dance in later years because everybody was more concerned about reminiscing and talking about old times than they were dancing. So, but anyway, Travis Norwood, I've been so intertwined with him. Uh, uh, you know, he was the one that I can remember that had did, did my job for years and years uh, ahead of time. And then I assisted him, and then unfortunately he died, and who was left but me to take over, which I did for about, I don't know, 14, 15 years, I guess. Thank you. 
<laughs> but now I just go last two years I've gone and just attended I have not had to plan it <laughs> yeah I think you earned a rest <laughs> <laughs> I think I do too well let me see if there's any other questions that you'd like to discuss or talk about um, do you have any particular favorite memory growing up in Mount Airy um well uh, let me see this is one of the uh, yeah I can uh, I can when I lived down on Hood Street, um, there was a double house, and on the other side of that house lived uh, Happy Albright. That wasn't his right name, but it was Howard. But anybody, he's the one who had the store uh, next to my father's. It was a furniture and appliance. And um, he was one of the first people in town, because they sold them, to have a TV set. <laughs> and I can remember when I was younger, coming home from school so I could go over there and they had at that time two, two uh, sons, there was another one, but he came along later. Um, one uh, two years older than I and one two years younger. I had to go over and watch Howdy Doody and hop along Cassidy between five and six because my father closed the store at six and I had to get over there for supper. But that, you know, I can remember that and them being over there and wa watching the TV, but finally a few years later we got our own. So, and the carnivals, and you know, was used to, my father didn't belong to Kiwanis, but he belonged to Lions, and he was also a, a member of the fire company, but he was not an active member because he was too involved, the store took too many hours out of his time, he couldn't just leave. Um, and he used to help uh, with the carnivals, and especially the Lions carnival, he called bingo for years up there. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, when they had it, when he was alive. And that's still going strong, the it's, carnival. That, well, it's a different organization now because it's the four county lines that had it. This, at that time, there was only one lines group, which was the original Mount Airy lines. Oh, okay, yeah. I didn't realize that. Yeah, there's, there, 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 there still is two, but the four county seems to have more young blood than the original, same as Kiwanis, have more young blood than the original Mount Airy lions who are you know, getting older, just like everybody else. And they do things, they have the yard sale, uh, you know, up at the, the uh, carnival grounds and, and do things like that, but they no longer do the carnival. Okay, that makes sense. So tell us a little bit about what the downtown Main Street was like. That well, there were four grocery stores down there, along with uh, lots of businesses, that, one, one restaurant, but uh, everything else is pretty much different now. Uh, of course, it has changed because that area burned out, you know, about 10 years ago when that fire took place. Uh, but I used to work, run the register after school and on weekends. And I can remember the Friday night drawings that they had. The store would be lined up all the way around. And I, was do, I did the checkout and, you know, people get people in, get them out there so they could be there if their name was called. And... Uh, you know, just in general, it was it was a fun experience. It really was. It was pretty happening uh, yes, down here. It, it was. Oh, it definitely. I mean, the crowds in Mount Airy on uh, Friday nights were tremendous. You can, I don't. I honestly, because I walked at that point from just down the street. I have no idea where these people parked now that I look back on it, because parking is a problem now. And with those pe that kind of people in there, I have no idea where they went. Yeah. But, that's yeah. That's a good question. Yeah. I mean, most of them came in from out of town, and along with the ones that could walk, I guess, they were close enough. Um, but I never thought about that. I mean, at that my age, I was, you know, a teenager or in my early 20s, and you just didn't think. They were there, and how did they get there, and where did they go when they, you know, the park? Well, Pat, thank you so much for taking the time oh, to talk gosh, with okay. us. Oh, gosh, okay. Well, we didn't touch <laughs> part of it, but I, you know, as, as I said, I just wrote notes, but that's fine. Yeah, maybe we'll have to come back and do you again, <laughs> get the rest of it. Yeah, thank you. Oh, okay, you're welcome.